And good afternoon to one and all. Uh, it is my pleasure this afternoon to um, be, be able to introduce um, an old friend, a brilliant, distinguished researcher whom I think I have known since she was a graduate student, amazingly enough. Um, Serena King is the professor and chair of psychology at Hamlin University. Uh, she's a licensed clinical psychologist, a PhD with a PhD from the University of Minnesota. Serena was awarded an early investigator grant from the National Center for Responsible Gambling has published in a variety of journals in the addiction and gambling fields, has presented at several gambling conferences, and completed a large-scale study of the Lao community in Minnesota with the support of the Minnesota Alliance on Problem Gambling. And that is, was absolutely breakthrough work. Recently, Dr. King's work has been focused on prevention and intervention in substance use and gambling disorders. She has engaged in work in, the commu in community consulting projects related to prevention and early intervention uh, methods in substance abuse and gambling. And she will be talking today about uh, the very massive project that she has done along with uh, Jean-Mi Richard on um, emergence of problem gambling from childhood to emerging adulthood. Serena, take it away. That is such a generous and kind introduction, um, Don, and I so appreciate and I value our professional uh, relationship we've built over the years. Thank you so much. Well, I'm really excited to share with you the findings from a large scale review that we recently published um, in the Journal of uh, Child Psychology and Psychiatry. Um, and that just literally came out online um, days ago. Um, so you can check out the full manuscript as it's been published. Um, so I'm gonna just start by saying a couple things. One is um, I know that some of the um, specifics around the gambling um, venues online and otherwise um, some of the images that I'll be showing, I've, I've been really trying to make it as um, trigger sensitive as possible, knowing that there are a lot of people in recovery. Um, but that being said, there are still images in this talk, and I just want to have you be aware of that. Um, so let's start with let's just let's um, let's start with talking about what the purpose and the goal of the talk were and who who was involved. Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it has been a whirlwind with this project. Um, this is one of the largest gambling projects I've ever undertaken. Um, so I'm really excited to um, share this, this, this new area with you. Um, so the first thing I wanna say is Jeremy Richard, who is um, an amazing researcher out of McGill University at the Inter International Center for Youth Gambling Problems and High-Risk Behaviors, under the mentorship of Dr. Jeff Derevensky, um, collaborated with me on this project. Actually, Jeremy was critical in having this project um, basically to the end of the project, and he serves as the first author on this paper I'm presenting, um, even though he is the first author. He has been incredibly skilled. Uh, I would never have been able to do this work without his, um, his, his mentorship. Um, he is a, a graduate student at McGill. If you, if you wanna get to know him, I, I really encourage anyone interested, get to know him. He has like over 20 something publications in the gambling field, and they are all top notch. Um, and he's only, and he hasn't even gotten his PhD yet. So he's, he's really quite amazing. Um, as I noted, there is the article that's been published re early release online um, in the annual review, um, systematic review for the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. So I first wanna say thank you so much to my students. Um, they were amazing. They wowed me. They, they helped develop the tables in the, in the paper. Um, they helped me intensively review the literature. Um, as you'll see, it was a big undertaking. Um, and Alice Kellner, Maggie Gavick, and Hannah Moore, who have all since um, actually graduated from Hamlin, are to be credited uh, highly for this work. 
So first of all, I want to talk to you. So, so what we're talking about today is the emergence of a variety of forms of novel gambling. And because of the internet and a, a lot of the sort of technological advances, um, we have seen a plethora of new opportunities, shall we say, around gamification of different types of games and gaming environments. So if you think about it, the variety that's out there now is impressive um, and it's hard to keep up with. I'm finding myself having a hard time to keep up with it. If you're finding yourself having a hard time keeping up with it, um, you shouldn't feel alone because I too and, and everybody in this field I think is, is feeling that as well. So today is an opportunity for me to introduce you to a variety of these, these gaming um, platforms, these ga the gambling uh, pre-gambling sort of activities and look at the, the level of risk that is um, perhaps transferred in these different modalities. So the first thing I wanna say is that in order to really study um, children and adolescents, we really need to take a developmental framework, right? So Jeff Derabensky at um, McGill University um, is sort of one of the founders of the developmental model of problem gambling. Their team has a, a wonderful clinic that looks at this. Um, and I, I would say he's kind of one of the forerunners in the field in terms of thinking about how do we take a lifespan developmental approach to, to gambling and gambling addiction. And in some of his work, um, he outlines this idea that behavioral addictions are a life course sort of um, developmental disorder. And the idea is that early on, children and adolescents may be more prone to engaging in risk-taking type behaviors. And we certainly know certain types of personality um, indicators may put people at greater risk for doing so. So um, it, this has been highlighted in um, the media, it's been highlighted in scientific literature on um, risk-taking in children. And we know that there are certain personality traits that put uh, kids at greater risk. But that being said, um, we also know that there's opportunities, right, that present themselves to elevate a child or an adolescent's risk. And as we see what's going on currently in the, in, um, the gambling world, in the gaming world, we have a lot of opportunity out there for children and adolescents. And there's a lot of variety out there. So children and adolescents get exposed very early to a lot of gaming and different types of gambling mechanisms within games and within apps. Um, and we're gonna be talking about how and what those, those mechanisms or those, those gaming opportunities look like. There actually have been almost no um, large scale reviews looking at the role of early involvement with these different types of novel forms of game, uh, gaming and gambling and what the prediction of later or concurrent problem gambling is. So that's the point of the review that we, we did, um, which was, like I said, one of the most extensive and, and comprehensive things I've, I've done in my career. So it was really definitely a learning process. Um, and the references for this paper will are, are in the published piece, but you can certainly um, check that out. So children and children and adolescents um, have a lot of individual differences in their risk for or vulnerability for reward and risk, right? So we know that just even early on when we have our children with technology sitting in front of us, um, there's a lot of, lot of sort of miniature um, uh, technological wins. And I, I noticed that with my own child who's right now about four and a half and PBS Kids has a lot of different games that are in, you know, in their app. And they build these games to really push up the wins, push up the dopamine. Um, there's definitely a, a psychology and a science to how we get reinforced, especially even just early on. And the more technological advances we get and the more gaming developers behind the scenes have this, the more we know that kids are gonna have sort of access to reward and risk in, in technology. Um, but we also know that children take rewards and risks before they even know what monetization looks like. So before they even know that they're losing, they already are taking risks, right? Like they might be um, playing with different virtual types of uh, products or coins or what have you, but basically reward and risk can be a developmental phenomenon that starts to emerge quite early. So, um, and then people have studied this in the adolescent and the child brain, looking at how do we represent that neuro neurobiologically, and certainly um, those at McGill have talked quite a bit about this. So the flip side is that, you know, the gaming industry, specifically the video gaming industry, has been really... Um, 
promotive of this idea that video gaming is actually maybe good for your health, good for your cognition. There's things that you can develop like mental flexibility and these kinds of things that can elevate, you know, your, your mental acumen or children's mental acumen. So you'll see like headlines like this association of video gaming with cognitive performance among children. You know, this is boosting your cognitive performance among children, even, you know, in the elderly and Late, out, uh, late adulthood, there's been some data on that. So there's certainly like kind of a pros, cons, benefits, cost analysis when we think about um, gaming in general. So there's been a lot of literature actually looking at video gaming as a pathway for addiction. It's just sort of um, not as well developed as other forms of um, addiction studies, if you will. Um, but like you can see, it's been highlighted in various um, mass media outlets, looking at are, are video games actually a pathway or a gateway to, to getting into more serious betting, serious problem gambling, these kinds of behaviors. So people have looked at theoretically is, is what we call the gamification of online and digital um, gaming or even video gaming. Are these types of behaviors actually setting the pathway towards something more significant and serious that might develop later on? Are we, are we placing kids at a greater risk? So I'm actually gonna show you a video here and I'm not gonna show all of it, um, I'm gonna pay attention to time here. Um, and, but I, what I do wanna say is that there's a lot of kind of anecdotal concerns um, of, with gamers in, in the gamer community looking at um, uh, monetization in the context of video games. So let's do that. Like there was definitely a time at a, at a summer camp that I was at where I was like the gambling ringleader and I got a bunch of other kids to kick in 50 bucks and like it was really fun when we won and then it was all gone very quickly. So I had about a hundred pounds worth of skins and I traded it in for one knife and I put it on the website, you know, obviously stressed out. It's Christmas Eve actually. I was doing this on Christmas Eve, I see here. Yep, trying to get a Christmas present. And I put it on the website, it builds up to 200, then I go in again builds up to 500. I go in again. I'm, I'm, you know, over the moon. Well, these skins were worth about two, two and a half thousand euros. I remember that number very distinctly because I went in again. Of course, there's no protections on these sites. Now, what I did then, it, it shows that I was into it way too much because I lost the bet. I had maybe 30, 40 pounds left of things that I didn't put in. I immediately went in again. Basically, after losing hundred dollars, I just took my bicycle drove to the next gas station where one or two hundred dollar Visa cards went back home, gambled them again. In my grade 11 math class, I remember doing coin flips for like 50 to 100 dollars on my phone during like a lecture. Like even when I was in high school, I was like, this could just become like a life ruining addiction. I absolutely not should not have had access to something like that. Like in hindsight, it's very easy for me to say that. And it's very easy for me to realize like that could have gone wrong. Like it did go wrong. I still gamble to this day and it definitely like seeded something in me that has not like gone away. When you're in middle school, you know what I mean? And you just won 1500 bucks, like that dopamine hit. It's impossible to just like turn, to just like shut that off. You lose all your money at CSGO lounge or a 15 year old gambling. You're not gonna just be like, all right, I'm done for the night. You're gonna be like, okay, how do I make another run at it? But it could have gone wrong in a in a life altering way, and I'm lucky that it didn't. I thought, let's see what else there is to gamble on. So yeah, then I went into live casino basically, which is blackjack, roulette. The thing is, when you're younger, money has a way bigger value to you. After you can finish school, you really need way more money to get to get the same rush. Let's say I'm betting $20 when I was 15, I would now need to bet three, four hundred dollars. Now that I start working, I have a, a half. So hopefully you're getting a taste this is actually from um a wonderful youtube channel that's kind of exposing the other side of the gaming industry called people make games they're out of the uk i encourage you to check it out if you're interested um but hopefully you're getting a sense that um problem gaming can start very early and exposure to various types of modalities can lay the foundation for later 
problems with problem gambling as well as problem online betting and other types of venues. Like there was definitely um, a sorry. So um really looking at I'm paying really close attention to time. I've got a lot to cover. So it's okay if we don't get to all of it, but I do want to kind of give you the upshot here. Um, we we also know that there are neurobiological links between gaming and gaming and gambling um, that lo are looking largely at the mesocortical limbic reward system and looking at how um, pathological problem gambling has been related to various um, decreases in activation in those reward systems. And we think that there might be some underlying um, similarities there when we think about risk for both video gaming and problem gambling. So looking at our, our large scale project, we really wanted to look at the, the adolescence to young adulthood period as a risk for problem gambling and high risk behaviors, looking at specific novel forms of betting. And we're gonna be going over like seven or eight of those, which is the why I'm concerned about time. So I just wanna give you a flavor of different types of, of um of these different novel games and I may not be able to get all to all of all of this I just want to kind of I want to be able to invite any questions that you might have so the behaviors and activities with gambling like features were included in this um, forms of gambling that may place youth at a risk for for various types of uh, gambling addictions or um, problem gambling. So because there are so many new cutting edge forms we tried to focus on just the ones that seem to come up uh, more strongly. So we asked the question, what are the association between activities with gambling or gambling like features or specific novel gambling activities and problem gambling? And this is in a youth up until age 25. Um, and so basically underlying, sorry, I'm trying to turn this off, um, underlying psychology or cognitive processes, um, including the association between activities with gambling like features, novel gambling activities, or risk for problem gambling. Um, and then also are there sex, age, or other demographic related differences in these associations? And so we looked at that using activities with gambling-like features, and you can see the ones listed here. We're gonna go over some of them and kind of give you background and foundation for that. And then also including social casino games, loot box use, video game uh, microtransactions, and skins wagering. Um, and you can see how we framed all of these different elements, um, including also looking at psychopathology, such as uh, mood, emotional stress, and other types of um, mental health issues, as well as cognitive processes, including um, impulsivity, gambling-specific cognitive distortions. So we were doing a wide range of things in this review, but our core purpose was to look at to what degree do these novel forms of gambling and gambling-like um, behaviors, novel forms of betting, to what extent do they predict problem um, gambling? So we used um, six databases. Um, Jer Jeremy was really uh, skilled at, at writing systematic reviews and doing all the logistics of them. And so he was amazing at guiding this process. Um, and we used Prisma um, scientific criteria for reviewing this, we, we actually edited and updated it to the 2020 guidelines in the middle of the project. Um, and we searched the database. So we used, um, we used the, the databases included that we talked about. And then we actually went through a process, both he and I looking at all these um, articles and screening them and for criteria for inclusion, exclusion, et cetera. So we screened literally, we searched out 2,700 articles. We screened ourselves alone, 1,824 articles. Then we screened them down to the eligible articles that were in the scientific peer reviewed literature, which then brought us down to 45 in the qualitative analysis. So why is that important? That's important because if you're going to systematically review the literature and say something about what these, these gaming um, novel for, forms of betting mean, you really wanna be doing that in a systematic way. So let's start with what is video gaming and why is it important video gaming? Um, is extremely prevalent youth, um, extremely. Um, you can see like this is from Game Putters, 231 million um, Americans play video games in the US and with only um, people rising in the amount of spent time spent gaming. So another piece of this is that we were looking for any things that were related to video gaming and problem gambling. And so we, we actually searched out the literature and uh, lo and behold, there were actually um, 15 relevant articles here. 
So then we kind of boiled them down and we found that four studies indicated more frequent uh, video game playing was associated with at risk or problem gambling. Six studies indicated greater severity with problem gambling, was this, or gaming was associated with problem gambling. And with university students and young adults, two studies found that problem gambling was associated with, or sorry, problem gaming was associated with problematic gambling. So the, the weight of the studies suggests that yes, problem or problem and frequent or excessive, if you will, video game playing lays a potentially lays a foundation for later problem gambling. But it the question becomes what kinds of video gaming and what engagement and for whom, right? So those are questions that we sought to answer later. So just to, for your background and knowledge, there's a lot of embedded in-app purchases in some of these um, games in in in-app in games, but also in-app. Um, play. We're having things like embedded casinos, even in things like um, Super Mario Brothers, um, Grand Theft Auto. There's a lot of research that suggests that those have that have more in-app purchasing may have a greater increase later on for later gambling. So embedded casino games can glamorize gambling for youth. And for example, we have one which such as Grand Theft Auto has an embedded casino game. Now the question becomes who uses that? Are people studying that? I don't think we have answers to that, but we just need to be aware that the casino gaming um, experience also is embedded in video games as well, including tokens rather than real world, world money. So let's get to you know, our phones, right? And our social media networks, right? So Facebook is the most popular platform for social media. And of course, some of you may or may not know, but a lot of the gambling type apps or the simulated betting, simulating, simulated casino apps are some of the most popular on the Facebook gaming platform. So that's something to know. And then let's get us, move us into this concept of social casino games, which some of you may have heard about confer at conferences or may have seen that in your practice. So the same technology that went into casino games also went into the social casino game world and specifically closely related to the real world counterparts. What we're seeing is literally a casino environment that's being simulated in a social casino format on on a social media app typically. And we have bonus spins, daily login spins, all sorts of spins, opportunities. Um, but we're gonna talk about this. Basically, this is virtual commodity, but you pay for the virtual commodity. So it's different than going to the casino, but it has a lot of simulated flavor to it. And it's, it's actually, we'll talk about later, it's actually easier to take risks in the sense that the risks don't aren't felt in the same way that you would feel them in a live casino environment. So the winning looks different. The winning, uh, the the stakes are tend the stakes, the perceived stakes seem lower, and also there are more wins. So it's there's not having to do the same thing that they would in a casino in terms of regulating the wins and and how you know what the procedures are. It's really very, it's kind of a wild west situation in a way. So we have um, defined social casino games are defined as games that are found in a social networking site. Um, where the core gameplay is the simulation of gambling activities. Now, oops, now you can imagine that simulating gambling activities is a slippery slope, right? Because if you're simulating, are you really losing? Are you really winning? Are you winning virtual commodity? Are you losing virtual commodity? Like you're kind of lost in space sometimes when you are in a different type of environment that isn't a typical casino. Game designers know how to play this game and they design these games for normal casinos using the same technology as the normal casino um, electronic um, gaming machines and other types of things. I can't say perfectly, uh, you'd have to have a, an industry person talk about these differences. Again, I'm, I'm a researcher and I'm just summarizing what I see. I certainly am willing to be corrected, um, but newer games, because these are newer games, there's less research. We know though that um, in a virtual commodified environment, anything can be seen as valuable and intermittent reinforcement in these environments obviously matter. So in our study, we found seven articles investigating the association between SCGs and simulated gambling and problem gambling. This wasn't a huge area relative to online, um, the online literature, the online gaming and betting literature, which we did see a much higher representation. But all cross-sectional studies did demonstrate a significant association between casino games and freer simulated gambling and problem gaming. 
Gambling. So let's, so we're moving fast to these different areas. You probably have heard about loot boxes. Loot boxes are in um, video game, um, um, I don't want to call them apps because they're not apps. They're in video game opportunities to wager and, and wager a lot of various types of things could be commodified, um, digitally commodified um, wins that you're going to have. And I'm going to, I'm going to be showing you a video about what that is. But let's back up and talk about if you don't know what loot boxes are, loot boxes have gotten a lot of negative attention and we say negative um, and they are controversial because some countries have actually outlawed loot boxes. Um, you can see on um, the slide here that there are certain countries like Belgium that had declared loot boxes illegal because they were inside video games and what they do is they you, they're looking for like you know, it's just kind of like, are you, you're going to go in and you're going to get a loot box and you're going to pay for a loot box. And is the big win going to be in there? What is the commodified digital um, win? And, and what's, what are the procedures and, and to how that win happens, right? So because kids' brains are developing, and this was really exposing children and young people to the idea of, of betting and using money for wins um, and intermittent reinforcement, these are these are sort of this was really seen as a kind of a I would say a, a dark side, but a, a more problematic side to the industry. And there's been a lot of controversy there, but there has been research on loot boxes and risk for later problem gaming and gambling, but specifically problem gambling. And there's some strong evidence there. So in our study, we found that we found seven articles on that particular topic, and we did find a pretty significant relationship between loot box engagement and problem gambling. This two, two of them investigated what we call microtransactions in video games, which there's a whole microtransactions literature. And by the way, I'm, I am new to this particular, these novel betting areas. So it's a lot of ground to cover. If I don't have all the answers for you, if you ask me, I will, I will look them up and reach out to you. Um, via email if you if you give me that. Um, increasing problem gambling severity was also associated with increased time spent on purchasing. Those who reported loot box use were more likely to report problem betting. And then esports e-sport, e bettors reported buying loot boxes more, um, more often, more, more than occasionally. So the time also spent on the microtransactions was particularly important and was associated, did have an association between problematic video gaming and problem gaming, uh, gambling. So we saw similar trends in this area for males and females, but throughout the paper, we did see higher risk for these types of novel betting, which we'll talk about later, that was more, was stronger for, for men than women or um, girls and boys, depending. So loot box purchasing also was more likely to be males. Um, I'm not sure if we have a ton of time to go over, we probably don't, <laughs> um, this particular, we're about half, I think we're about halfway um, through, but um, I would encourage you, I'll show you a little clip of this, I'll, just a little uh, teaser on this one. Um, Game Quitters, which is Cam Adair's um, uh, dot com platform on video game um, addiction, if you will, or video game um, patternistic video game playing um, has specifically the skin spotting loot boxes informational. So I'm going to show you quickly what we're talking about here with skin spotting. We're moving in. Skins gambling. In this video, we will share information on skins gambling in video games. We will cover what skins gambling is, what some problematic aspects of it are, and how to get help if skins gambling is causing problems in your life. What are skins? Skins are virtual items that you can accumulate inside a video game that decorate weapons or characters. Skins sometimes give the player an advantage in the game, but most skins are just cosmetic items to customize the look of your character. A gamer either earns skins as rewards when they get to new levels, or they can buy skins from a store within the game. In the past few years, skins have become a form of virtual currency. That is, players trade skins with each other in exchange for virtual or real-life money. 
Some skins are harder to get in a game while others are more common. Some skins, like certain knives or certain guns, for example, are bought and sold for thousands of real life dollars. Steam is the main online marketplace where players can buy, trade, and sell skins. But in the past few years, other smaller websites have been launched as well, including crypto websites. Okay, so how does gambling come into this? Gaming has reached a global audience through esports. That is organized competitive video game competitions that millions of people watch as they are being played. Like with other sports, people want to bet on the outcomes of these matches. Some people will use real cash while others can bet their skins on third party websites. Some of which allow you to exchange your skins for cash. So placing a bet with a virtual skin can be the same as gambling with actual money. That's skins gambling. Loot boxes are another area of concern that have been introduced into video games in recent years when it comes to potential gambling behavior. Loot boxes are virtual items in video games that contain rewards. You either earn or purchase a sealed mystery box that contains a randomized reward, meaning there is no guarantee of what may be inside. The rareness of- So you're getting a sense of, hopefully now, of what the industry in terms of um, these different types of platforms, these different types of commodification, uh, different types of monetization, different ways in which money gets um, used in the context of, for example, skins betting and loot boxes. And I encourage you to look at the full um, full video of that if you want to educate yourself more on um, gamecoders.com. So it's some really great educational uh, material there. So getting into what we found was two articles in, in, the, in our study investigated relationships between skins gambling, I'm sorry, skins betting and gambling behavior. Um, overall, we did find a strong positive association in this small sample of studies because again, a emerging area, but a concerning area that several researchers in the field have, have noted. Um, there's also some data on different types of gamblers finding that esports betters had higher rates of frequent skins wagering compared to sports betters and other gamblers. So there's that these fine tuned analyses of what what the patterns of skins wagering people who are skins wagering are looks like, and then also um, significant associations with uh, predicting esports betting. So now we're gonna to get to like the largest part of the study, which was around 27 articles that we reviewed in terms of novel forms of betting. And of course, the large proportion of, the, of these studies were looking at online gaming or online gambling specifically, or mobile betting, um, which includes other types of, can include sports betting and can include all sorts of um, betting environments. Um, specifically, we know that kids can become addicted right on an app, right on their, you know, right on a phone, right on a computer. Um, there's been a lot of research on this in Derevensky's um, work with their, their child um, clinic where they're, they're treating uh, very young um, problem gamblers who, who are engaging in online betting specifically quite frequently. Um, and the, there's been a lot of systematic reviews looking at you know, the small literature here. So the upshot is we should be concerned because the online environment does provide um, a lot of opportunity to do un, you know, unmanaged, unlooked at you know, types of venues that, that children and youth can get involved in. Um, 27 studies in our in our review included the cross-sectional studies, children and adolescents. Um, a large majority of them found a significant relationship between the frequency and frequent online gambling environments and an increased risk for problem gambling. And this is in youth again, up till age 25. Um, there were was online gaming, including sports betting, that were significantly associated with problem gambling. We do see that association. And we see also that access and opportunity play a very big role in whether or not somebody might be at greater risk for these types of behaviors, which gets us to, of course, we're in the era of sports betting, especially with all the legislation coming on board. And we also know that fantasy sports is a big area of interest in the gambling community. Um, despite all the interest from our review of, of 
children and adolescents under 25, we did not find a lot of studies that met the criteria. Um, that being said, like it gets a lot of play in the literature or in the in the media too about fantasy sports. We're really we've become increasingly concerned in the college student population. I think this is a conversation that um, is happening today on on various stages at the conference, um, looking at the science of or the concerns with fantasy football and sports betting and a variety of other types of venues. But we know that this is a growing area of, of interest and concern. So in this emerging literature, we only did find two articles using the same sample of, of adolescents actually. And they show that seasonal fantasy sports betting and fantasy sports were predictive of at-risk gambling. Um, and also females were highlighted in these studies looking at um, endorsing daily or seasonal fantasy betting environments to which did elevate the risk for problem gambling. Um, sports betting was correlated with problem gambling, but the association was no longer significant in a model. So it's basically the case that there's very little literature focusing exclusively in the under 25 age group on fantasy sports that met our criteria, which kind of surprised me actually, but um, it may just be a matter of time. Speaking of small areas of literature, another one was the esports betting world. I know this is something that's being talked about on a national level, um, the emergence of esports betting and its risk for um, increasing risk for problem gambling. So I'm just wanna introduce you just briefly to what esports are. I'm glad I'm doing okay with time here. I think, um, and we'll have at least 15, 10, 15 minutes to have questions. Um, it's almost about to go. Have you heard about esports and wondered what all the hype is about? Or maybe you're a pro gaming fan and you're just curious to learn more about it. In this video, we're gonna talk about what esports is, why it's so popular, and also discuss some of the potential health risks that are happening in the industry. What's up everyone, Cam here, and today I'm really excited to talk about esports. Do you know what esports is? If you do, say yes in the comments, and if you don't, say no. Esports is one of the hottest topics around the world these days, and I even recently spoke at the NCAA all about it. But did you know that esports actually dates back to the early 90s? The rise of the internet brought online gaming, and it was inevitable that we would eventually see organized competitions. In 1997, 2,000 people played in a Quake tournament and Quake was the hottest arena shooter game at the time. Shortly after, the Cyber Athlete Professional League, also known as the CPL, was formed and they hosted their first tournament. While it took off rapidly, it certainly wasn't the industry it is today. Fun fact about Cam, I actually volunteered to work for Sevo as one of their customer support people back in the day when I played Counter-Strike. As organized competitions began to be formed, so too were prize pools. And one tournament by the CPL just prior to the year 2000 actually had a prize pool of $15,000. Now, I would take $15,000 today, so it's certainly not chump change, but it definitely has nothing in comparison to tournaments these days that can be upwards of $25 million. That's a 150,000% increase during this 20 year span. Fast forward to 2019 and there are international competitions happening all over the world. There are scholarships for college students. There is a high school league and some tournaments even have more viewers than the Super Bowl and the Final Four. As we can see, esports is now a global phenomenon. So what is esports and why is it so popular? So again, running a little bit awareness of time. Um, something to know is that the esports industry has been argued to be one of the most um, profitable in terms of media industries um, in the world right now. So it's really coming to its own in terms of what um, the potential is there. Um, and so I encourage you to kind of learn more about this if you if you want to educate yourself on what the risks might be. It's almost about to um, so kind of reviewing our overview of this, 
Um, what we did find, so this is kind of a, a schematic of what we found, um, but basically all of the things that we reviewed, including video games, um, problem video gaming, loot boxes, skins gambling, online gambling, social casino games, fantasy sports and esports, in terms of risk for problem gambling in youth under the age of 25 specifically, the answer is yes, we did find evidence. Some of these areas had stronger evidence than others. Some of these areas had more studies than others. And some of these areas had better studies than others. And we actually did a quality assessment as part of this review. It was extensive. It was a 15 point quality assessment where we made sure that the articles that we included were of high quality according to scientific standards. We also, we also kind of had a theor theoretical framework looking at whether or not these particular forms of gambling or betting had a, a possible gateway mechanism. So we did think that there was support for video games, loot boxes, skins gambling, online. Um, online gambling is a question mark. We still, the, the diversity of these um, platforms really didn't, we weren't sure, but definitely social casino games. And then there just wasn't enough evidence, there wasn't enough data um, on fantasy sports and esports to make any conclusions. And I think one of our findings in our discussion or talking about in our discussion was the predominance of social reinforcement. So when you think about something like esports or you think about something like social casino games, um, sometimes even video gaming or problem video gaming, there's a lot of social engagement in these in these platforms. And so there's a lot of sense of, you know, urgency of do, you know doing well in the public face or the public eye, having kind of a win publicly, um, having a, a social environment that's being engaged. Um, and especially when we think about something like esports, where this is like a high octane, um, high um, excitement level that's going on and just kind of a real community. So in a lot of communities and when we think about video gaming as one of them there is sort of a cultural there's a culture of video gaming um, and engagement that I think um, lends itself to kind of that social reinforcement mechanism so oops so we did find you know we we looked at esports betting as well um, and there's a lot on esports betting um, and the data are, are suggestive of of risk um, also, we looked and we, we thought it was important to look at psychopathology. So specifically the type, forms of psychopathology that have been traditionally recognized as increasing risk for problem gambling, um, including things like ADHD, hyperactivity, emotional problems, stress, anxiety. All of these factors did have some evidence towards pr predicting um, problem gambling by age 25. Um, also looking at conduct disorder or conduct difficulties at age 16. Um, there was a moderate rise in problem gambling and also just mental health in, in general, having low, you know, poor mental health was more predictive of problem gambling later on. When we looked specifically at gambling related cognitions or cognitive styles, we there were a lot of studies on actually loot boxes and online gambling in that area. So it seemed like those topics were more well developed in the literature than other novel forms of gambling and gaming. Um, and the gambling related cognitions were also associated with increases in online gambling frequency and problem gambling among adolescent females. So there were certain areas of literature where females were actually, I would say highlighted, but the, the, the trajectories of female, um, female participants tended to be you know, more emphasized in the studies. Um, and so online gambling was one area. Um, and also, so there was some data on video gaming as well. So, you know, what can we make of all this? I think what we can make of it is we now know a little bit more from, from looking at the literature where we maybe need to grow in terms of the numbers of studies that need to come out about risk for problem gambling. Um, the online betting literature is much more well-developed. Um, and we also know is that it's established that, you know, online gambling early on has a, has a, potentially um, problematic or effect on the risk for problem gambling. Um, but fantasy and esports seem to be a more, I don't say uncharted water, but there are far fewer studies in that area. But the studies that have been done intensively that meet criteria suggest there is really a need to explore um, these associations between fantasy sports, esports, and problem gambling in youth. And then we have social casino games, plenty of studies on social casino games, not quite as much as online betting, 
But what we do, what we are concerned about this is the, is the slippery slope of that sort of um, commodification of, of various types of, you know, different types of um, chips and different types of wins that are not like you typically would see in a casino setting, yet there are lots of big wins there. And so social casino games have gotten a lot of attention on a national level. This is something that needs to be really explored, especially looking at kind of like why and how are these games addictive. So I think one of the things as a researcher in this area and reading deeply, I think one of the big missing pieces has been how and why are these different forms of betting associated with problem gambling, right? Like what is the mechanism? And so we in the, in the article try to, to ferret out what the mechanisms might be and we, we conjecture some, some theories around it, but these types of things really need to be explored more intensively either in an experimental environment or really looking closely at players. Um, then we have loot box engagement, that data are, are strong. Um, they, it's a high profile in terms of what, what it's, what, but it's been in science. There's been a lot of high-profile articles on loot boxes and their risks for problem game uh, gambling and, and children and adolescents. And then video gaming is like, I think, one of the newer frontiers, right? Like video gaming is not a new frontier, but what's going on inside the games are. And we really need to start looking at um, kind of having, I don't know how to describe this, like education and warning and awareness and um some sort, I mean, potentially regulations, um, which which we talk about in the article as well. So where that gets me to, and I'm pay attention to my time. Okay, good timing. Um, the establishment of rules and regulations towards protecting children and adolescents may be particularly important. Um, we talk about this a lot, but we don't take a lot of it. Unfortunately, I don't see us taking a lot of action um, and insistence and regulation and rules and laws. Um, and so there can have to be a more comprehensive risk reduction approach, especially for high risk wagering in apps and, and different games. And I'm not talking about just run of the mill video gaming. I'm talking about things that have a high risk for the gamification of the video game experience. Um, also, we need regulatory approaches that are around certain video game features that are high risk as well as empirically driven approaches to the treatment of youth problem gambling. I think this is a very hidden, very hidden problem in our communities. And it's a very, and, and also with young children or children in general, it can be very, and families can be very shame-based in terms of coming, coming for help, becoming aware, accepting there's, there's a concern and bringing one to the fore and really talking about this. I mean, just as evidence of that, I think I think about like the Minnesota community and our treatment community, and I, I I'm starting to think like we aren't there's not a lot of talk about this in in the treatment community, partly because I think it's really really um, a newer frontier um, that we're we're now facing in, in problem gambling, um, and the risk minimization and harm reduction approaches need to be included um, for youth gaming and gambling. This can't be under you know like under the radar really has to be right out there. Psychoeducation and self-monitoring um, devices and innovations need to start to happen. So um, I think I'm gonna stop here and give you my email address and ask if there are any questions just under the wire for time. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, um, but I can certainly go back a slide. Any questions for Serena? All right, Serena, something, well, a couple of things that struck me. Um, one was that, um, you know, I kept coming back to something that uh, Dr. Dewey Jacobs said to me a couple of decades ago, uh, which was that, you know, anything, I guess I got to stand over this way, um, said, you know, you can become addicted to anything, even a violin. And, um, you know, I, I, and I was wondering to what, what, you know, all of these different things that we're looking at aren't just manif manifestations of that phenomenon, that anything that gives you pleasure is potentially addictive. And what do we need to look for for unique characteristics that make something more or less hazardous? Um, and then I have no idea where I go from that, but. Uh, yeah, no, I, I love to comment on that. I think that. 
I think we also want to add the interface to that, which is at a developmental level, right, Don, that um, what makes something pleasurable developmentally at different ages or different stages for different individuals and different populations, um, that looks, that, that also is a factor, right? Like what gaming developers, um, gambling platform developers, they already kind of are thinking along those lines. Um, but we do need to ask the question, what is pleasure? What is pleasurable at various ages and stages? And how does that put somebody on, on a greater pathway towards risk? Any, anything else? You know, when you, uh, you talk about regulation, um, it also strikes me that this is um, a worldwide phenomenon yes how how and who can regulate these activities when they're not necessarily coming from minnesota or the u.s um you know, they could be coming from some ship offshore somewhere as you know as 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 far as we know um you know mm -hmm. so i mean how practical actually is a regulatory strategy and then if it's not, what can we do in terms of alternative prevention approaches? These are incredibly important questions. I think it really just depends on the platform and the regulation that is available on whatever type of media we're talking about, right? Like I learned from this process and, and doing the video with um, the UK group, um, one of the clips that I should, I was actually interviewed for one of those videos is there is a huge industry also, not industry, there's a huge profession of video, um, esports and video gaming um, attorneys <laughs> that are prosecuting and regulating and advising the industry. And we as researchers and potentially policy changers, makers, influencers, however you want to make it, need to be on board with the the legal end of this because there's a growing legal end of regulation and understanding of of what you know product development and patenting and all this stuff that i don't i don't have a degree in um needs to be on board so i would like to know what the precedent has been in terms of policy and regulation and to really be able to say but i think various platforms have various um shall I say risks for reg risk for limits to regulation is a, is a good way to describe that. Um, are, do you have thoughts about that, Don? I, I don't know. Um, mm. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not overly optimistic on, on that, <laughs> yeah. you know, on that prospect other, other than, you know, maybe there would be some activities that we could sort of give the good housekeeping seal of approval to, uh, oh, sure. meet, you know, that because they meet, certain standards and then you have an issue where you can maybe potentially educate parents to you know is your child is your child doing these activities if so are they doing it on one of these sites that have this standard that you know coming from whomever it happens to be mm -hmm. uh, you know this is this is just something again you as a parent need to watch out for and i that you know i think in this case for those age groups i think uh parental intervention yeah probably the most effective and, uh, and promising thing that we that we have to offer i think certainly i think it's likely to be more effective than a formal governmental regulatory structure yeah i can definitely see that i mean one of the things you know i've watched in the opiate industry or opiate not industry opiate opiate concerns i say opiate crisis sorry i didn't mean to say industry just mix my words up um is the is how Snapchat and other types of platforms have been kind of, um, I want to say shamed. I'm not saying it's effective um, in, in dispersing um, like the fentanyl and other types of very dangerous substances, but just thinking about like how that model of, I want to say shame and regulation or how that works, like if that's even possible here. And I think that 
I don't know. I, th I believe you, Don, when you say it's, I think it's it's not going to be hopeful. Um, maybe with social media that there might be a, a different story there. And I don't know what you think about the social media um, channels um, with social casino gaming. But yeah, I mean, I think you're right. You're right. It's it's going to be hard. We, we have anything from uh, the folks playing along at home or? Serena, we got a comment from JJ, and he said, this is an absolutely awesome presentation. I have learned more in this hour than I knew about this topic in all my 30 years of counseling. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, JJ. Please reach out to me via email. I would love to talk to you further. I just really wanna learn more about your counseling practice. All right, let's, uh, Serena, thank you so much, and uh, let's show her our appreciation. Thank you so much.